pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, today's event is the result of over a year of research and, and uh, planning by the Mars and Mills Historical Society and Cape Cod Chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, to honor the 12 patriots as noted in your program who served in a Revolutionary War. If anyone who has uh, researched family history is an, indeed a rewarding but often difficult task, uh, but the results of that research always sheds new insight into your individual family history in general, as we will specifically see today these 12 patriots who served their country. History is a great teacher, a uh, glimpse into the past can provide a source of wisdom and inspiration for the future. As we honor these 12 patriots today, let us be mindful of their service uh, to our nation and let us rededicate ourselves to the principles that all compatriots hold sacred. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam god bless america my home sweet home god America, my home sweet home. On behalf of the Marston's Mills Historical Society, I want to add my welcome. This is uh, an event that is the result of uh, many months of research, particularly by the Sons of the American Revolution, and in particular David Schaefer, uh, the research genealogist, and our historian Jim Gould. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to Charles Rye, who is the chaplain of the Sons of the American Revolution chapter, Cape Cod chapter, for the invocation and the Sons of the American Revolution pledge. As we gather, O oh God, for this dedication today, we ask your blessings upon each of us. We thank you for this occasion as we honor the memory of these individuals. We esteem their patriotism and courage and their faith and loyalty and their willingness to sacrifice to make our world a better place. We thank you too for America and all patriots who have given us the liberties and privileges that we enjoy today. May we be willing to serve you and our nation every, as they did. May the ideals that we remember from the past sustain us today and safeguard us tomorrow. Amen. I'll now lead the pledge of the SAR. We descendants of the heroes of the American Revolution, who by their sacrifice established the United States of America, reaffirm our faith in the principles of liberty and our constitutional republic, and solemnly pledge ourselves to defend them against every foe. On this day, we would like to present a citation from the House of Representatives, and I will read in part, and I will ask Randy to also read in part. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts House of Representatives, be it hereby known that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to the Marston's Mills Historical Society and Sons of the American Revolution in recognition of, in recognition of your efforts to recognize and honor local Revolutionary War veterans, the entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. And it is signed by both Randy Hunt, me, and Will Crocker, and also by the Speaker of the House, dated 10th day of October, 2020. To have the living descendants of a number of these patriots who will meaningfully place an American flag in the medallion that is next to the gravestone. 
we'll start with Ansel Adams and Marguerite Adams, who is the third great granddaughter of Ansel Adams, will place the flag at his gravesite. We have six different people with the surname of Crocker. Will Crocker, who is a direct descendant of several of these and an indirect descendant of the rest, who will place a flag at the gravesite of Joseph Crocker. And while he's doing that, I will read the names of the other Crockers uh, who will be honored uh, with flags later on today. Uh, Benjamin Crocker, Bursley Crocker, Ebenezer Crocker, whose gravesite was marked a few years ago and is right by the roadside, Isaac Crocker, and William Crocker. It is the gravestone of Seth Goodspeed, and we've invited B.B. Brock, who is the fourth great granddaughter of Seth Goodspeed, to mark his grave with a flag. Two members of the Hinckley family, and both of these uh, gravestones are marked by direct descendants. First of all, uh, Debbie Hinckley Lovell will mark the gravestone of Enoch Hinckley, and then Trafton Hinckley will mark the gravestone of Enoch's grand uncle, Timothy Hinckley. We have two sisters who are direct descendants of Abner Jones, fourth great granddaughters, Maureen McPhee and Karen Meyer. And would you mark Abner Jones' gravesite? That is the only stone that is not with the older ones that are down nearer to the roadside. And lastly, I'm going to mark the gravesite of Nymphus Marston. Uh, I am a uh, fifth, I guess, fifth cousin or cousin fifth removed uh, of Nymphus Marston, and I will mark his grave. Uh, stone at this time. to provide an understanding of, of their service during the American Revolution, it's, it's important to understand that all of them were members of the local militia. And here today is to speak about the militia and how they were organized is Jonathan Lane, who has more than 30 years of public history and cultural programming he is currently the coordinator of Revolution 250, a consortium of more than 60 organizations across the Massachusetts Commonwealth, partnering together on the commemoration of the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Beautiful autumnal morning here on the Cape. Uh, so I just want to state, uh, Revolution 250 started back in 2015 when uh, leaders in the field of Revolutionary War history in Massachusetts decided that the 250th was coming and we needed to do something about it. So uh, from the very get-go, Revolution 250 was very much built as uh, an organization that would support the interests and events that occur all throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You know, we love Lexington and Concord, we love Bunker Hill, the Tea Party, we're absolutely going to do those things. But at the same time, we want to recognize that this was an event that was uh, affected every community across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And more than just sending men to war, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but also 
providing the material of war, uh, providing the funds with which to pay the services of these gallant soldiers, uh, and, and much, much more. Some of you here in Barnstable, of course, the closing of the courts is a big one in uh, 1774. So there's a lot to do. We encourage you to get involved, find ways, visit us at revolution250.org. Uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the militia experience, and I'm not gonna tarry too long uh, with the story, but you have to understand that the men who went off in 1775 in defense of our individual rights and freedoms were doing so based on a system that had been in place for the better part of 150 years. And when the first settlers came here, they recognized the need for self-defense, obviously, there was no standing British army to come and save them. So they relied upon each other for the defense of their homes. And they formed militia companies. And initially they were town-based. Every town had its militia company. The, the town would elect uh, the captain and the other officers as they would in a town election. And that's actually one of the great features of pre-revolutionary war life here in Massachusetts. And one of the things that helps drive the revolutionary narrative, they have uh, congregational churches which elect their own ministers. They have town meetings where they discuss the issues and elect their own town officers. And the militia was no different. The militia was entirely community driven. They elected their own officers as well for the company. So this year is, of course, the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. It was the last event we did before everything was closed. And in March of 1771, they, uh, people of Boston decided they wanted to do something to commemorate the, uh, uh, the event that had occurred just the year before. And they arranged for a speaker who was James Lovell Jr., who was an usher in the Boston Latin School. And one of the things that he said, which is true to our topic today, which is the true strength and safety of every commonwealth or limited monarchy is the bravery of its freeholders, its militia. And that is certainly something that the people of Massachusetts felt strongly about. And it is enshrined in the earliest charters of the colonies and uh, after actually in the 1690s when Massachusetts Bay was formed by combining Plymouth Colony and Massachusetts Bay Colony, the new charter enshrined how the militia was to function. The governor, of course, is commander in chief and uh, each town is electing its own command officers within the company, but the field officers are chosen by uh, well, in theory, by the, by the captains and lieutenants. So the captains and lieutenants of a particular region would get together and they would choose a field officer, a colonel, and a lieutenant colonel, and a major. And these would be uh, approved of by the governor or by uh, the governor's council. Now, of course, the problem comes around 1774 when the people of Massachusetts were denied the right to use the general court, which was their representative government. And the House of Representatives had a role in the militia. The militia could not be used outside of the state of Massachusetts without approval of the House of Representatives. Or in times when the House was not in session, there was a time when the House wasn't in session, uh, in the times when it wasn't in session, the governor and his council could opt to send the militia out, but only until the House of Representatives came back into session, and then they would have to vote on whether to continue to allow the men of Massachusetts to serve in Rhode Island or Connecticut New or New Hampshire. In 1774, General Gage essentially uh, shut down the General Court of Massachusetts. And uh, uh, this was part of the uh, Massachusetts Government Act that was passed by Parliament. And in its place, the people of Massachusetts said, we're going to elect our representatives and we're gonna send them to what we call the Provincial Congress, which uh, first started in Salem 
And then after a couple of days in Salem, they moved to Concord, Massachusetts. And there they sat, and they sat in Concord, they sat in Watertown, Cambridge, uh, and they acted as a de facto general court. And one of the first things they did was to revamp the militia laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So every man between the ages of 16 and 60 years old is a member of the militia. Now in 1774, they revised it downward. They said, okay, every man between 16 and 50 is a member of the militia. Not to say that those of us who are now between 50 and 60 got off scot-free. They essentially created a three-tier system. So first, there were the minute companies. Every town was asked to take a certain proportion of their militia, make sure that they were armed and equipped completely, and that they trained as often as twice a day. Some communities did it twice a week, but some communities did it as much as twice a day. Now you have to remember, these are people who already had full-time employment. They were farmers, they were craftsmen, they were tradesmen, they were merchants, they were fishermen, they governed the sea. Uh, so this is a huge commitment, and the towns were responsible for paying them. Now, the Provincial Congress would eventually uh, come back and provide some money to reimburse the towns, but initially the towns were responsible for paying the minute companies. Beyond the minute companies, there were your general militia. So the trained band is what they called them. And this was everybody else up to the age of 50. And the trained band would usually gather three, four times a year to train. And their weapons, uh, might, they might not have all the necessary accoutrements for long service, uh, but they would be trained, they would know the manual of arms, they would have officers that they would elect, and they were separate from the minute companies. And then after that, they had what's called the alarm list. And the alarm list was everybody else. So those of us who are over the age of 50, but not quite as old as 60, we're on the alarm list. Uh, and uh, they would also include all the people who were excluded by uh, the Militia Act. And there's actually a fair extensive list for exclusions. If you were a student at Harvard, you were excluded from militia service. If you were a town selectman, you were excluded from militia service. Now that's not to say that selectmen did not serve, there are many who did, uh, but they, weren't, they could not be compelled to serve under the law. Um, so the alarm list is particularly interesting for this region. Uh, as you will hear, I'm gonna, actually just gonna read a, a brief letter. Let's see. In Massachusetts in 1778, of course, things are dire. And as a matter of fact, the, 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 the height, really, from a manpower perspective of the American Revolution is 1777. There's about uh, 48,000 men in service, not from Massachusetts, but overall. Massachusetts at that time had about 17 or 18,000 men. And uh, the Massachusetts militia was also very active, particularly in regions around the seacoast. And this is a letter that uh, Brigadier General Joseph Otis of Barnstable writes to uh, the Massachusetts Council. The council had been asking for men to go to Rhode Island to help support the activities against uh, the British in Newport. They had also asked for men for nine months to serve in Fishkill, New York, or along the Hudson River. And th the men of Barnstable already had their hands full serving down on Noshon Island, in Hyannis Harbor, Falmouth. And so this is what uh, Joseph Otis writes. May it please your honors, I beg leave to represent the situation of this country uh, excuse me, county, and to ask for some direct, or uh, to ask for some directions of my superiors in office. The situation of this county is that from Chatham to Bedford, and that's New Bedford, we have British shipping who have stopped all passing by water and are so bold that they anchor frequently in Woods Hole, Quick's Hole, and off Hyannis and take everything that passes 
and am informed they are stripping the islands of the stock, which will be a public loss and a benefit to our enemies. And as there is a company of soldiers stationed at Nashon whose time is up, and that's a very important aspect, militia soldiers only want to serve for the time they're hired for and no longer, because it means a loss to them and their families for their traditional employment. Uh, it, I think it is absolutely necessary to have that island guarded, especially as there is a number of cannon there belonging to the public, um, and which must entirely stop the navigation of the Sound in Dartmouth Bay. I have ordered a party of militia on the island till further orders from the council, promising to do all in my power, and here's the key part, that they shall be paid for their time. Payment was um, another key aspect of this. I think our situation is such in this county that we want at present much guarding as any place when the enemy are within shot of many of our houses and there is a requisition for 70 militia to march to Providence that leave our own property exposed and the militia think it hard and it causes much uneasiness. Uh, and I am far from saying any word that this brigade should not do their proportion to the general and righteous opposition we are engaged in. And he goes on to essentially say, you know, we're doing our part, but we have men off in the Navy. We have militia scattered hither and yon, and, you know, we have farms to tend. So this becomes a constant back and forth, not just between Barnstable and the council, but really across the Commonwealth. If you lived out in the Berkshires, you were constantly being called on to defend the Hudson River and the Hudson Valley, or to go to Fort Ticonderoga, or to fight at Saratoga. If you lived on the North Shore, you were constantly being sent to places up in Maine to defend the coasts uh, of what we called Upper Massachusetts. Uh, so there's a lot being asked of the people. And it's not just the men who are going off to fight either, because when they leave, all the slack that needs to be taken up in those households, on those farms, in those fisheries, are being taken up by the families they leave behind. And so this is one of the reasons that it's critical in this coming 250th celebration that we recognize that this event, while we celebrate and commemorate the services of the people who went off and fought at Bedford, or Falmouth, or Providence, or any of the battles the Continental Army took place in, we have to recognize the impact this had on communities across the Commonwealth along the home front. And, you know, we think of the generation of World War II as being the greatest generation, probably one of the great literary phrases used in the last 50 years. But the more you look at what the people did during the American Revolution, the more you can understand where that spirit came from. And it starts here in places like Barnstable in, seven, in the 1770s. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you at 250th events over the next uh, six, seven years. Our second speaker is more of a local uh, citizen. Professor Emeritus Frederick Lawrence, Jr. was born in Woods Hole. In retirement, Fred spends summers at his family home in Wacoit, sailing and researching Cape Cod history. In 2008, Fred authored the book that I used to research the service of some of the men who are buried here, titled A Journal of Occurrences Along the Rebel Coast, a Chronology of Revolutionary War naval events in the waters south and west of Cape Cod, 1775 to 1781. I would note that uh, the uh, history is divided into roughly three periods. Uh, a first period in which there was friendly disagreements as to what we were doing, and then after which, uh, when the Battle of Concord occurred, there was a uh, hardening of positions and people became very intransigent as to, to what was what was going to happen. And finally, in the third period, is uh, in your notes there is a horizontal line which breaks, breaks these periods into periods. Uh, the third period is when France entered the war. At this point in time, things got very, very serious. It became a world war. The attitude of England hardened, and the idea of rapprochement was all over, and it was 
was not nice after that. In 1765, there was a Stamp Act which was passed to gain revenue for England, which failed, and then the Townshead Act, which imposed duties on paper, glass, paint, and other common items. The governor of Massachusetts Bay uh, province, uh, Francis Bernard, requested military forces to protect the king's personnel, so in October 1768, British troops arrived and occupied the city of Boston. The Sons of Liberty and other patriot organizations organized boycotts of goods subject to the duty, and their founder was John Adams and John Hancock, James Otis, Paul Revere, many of the notables of revolution, which undertook to harass the British and to small acts of terrorism against those people. A half a year after this, a year and a half later, in March, 5th, 1770, the Boston Massacre uh, was an inevitable consequence of these past acts. John Adams defended the British soldiers and they were found not guilty. Two years after this, in 1772, June 9th, the packet sloop Hannah left Newport for Providence. When the revenue cutter Gaspe gave chase, Hannah's captain lured them across the shallows off Namquid Point in Narragansett Bay and left the British ships hard aground. John Brown of Providence organized an attack that night by the Sons of Liberty and burnt the vessel. The British could never locate a responsible person. A year and a half later, on December 16, 1773, the Boston Tea Party occurred and John Adams wrote, Last night, three cargoes of Boya tea were emptied into the sea. This morning, a man of war sails. This is the most magnificent moment of all. There's a dignity, a majesty, a majesty of solemnity in this last effort of the patriots that I greatly admire. The people should never rise without doing something to be remembered, something notable and striking. A, year, a half year later, the, board, the Boston Port Act closed the port of Boston. The Massachusetts Government Act effectively abolished the provincial government of Massachusetts and General Thomas Gage, already a commander-in-chief of the British troops in North America, was also appointed governor of Massachusetts and instructed to enforce royal authority. Patri Patriot resistance compelled the newly appointed royal officials of Massachusetts to resign or seek refuge in Boston. Gage commanded four regiments of British regulars, about 4,000 men, from his headquarters in Boston but the countryside was largely controlled by Patriot sympathizers. The first Continental Congress was convened in Philadelphia in 1774, September 5th. Now switching to locally, two months later at the Barnstable Courthouse, we've already, our past speaker already spoke about the events there, a considerable body of men from Middleborough, more from Rochester and many from Wareham, repaired to Sandwich. And there they were joined by a large part of the population of that town. The mob prevented the session of court and compelled the justice to assign certain political obligations in harmony with its own views. Dr. Nathaniel Freeman of Sandwich was unanimously chosen conductor in chief of the enterprise. November 11, 1774, the militia companies were formed on Cape Cod. April 1970-75 was the Battle of Concord, and Mr. Watson wrote that 700 poor, despised Yankees, I glory in the name, should have put to flight the totally and totally defeated 1,700 of Lord North's best picked troops, consisting of Grenadiers and Earl Percy's regiment of Welch Fusiliers, is a circumstance deeply mortifying to those who thought themselves invincible. Ned Winslow, later to be heard of again, was in the action and had his horse shot under him. Blood was shed and the Patriot and Tory physicians hardened. April 30th, 1775, shortly thereafter, Vice, Admiral's, Vice Admiral Samuel Graves wrote to his lieutenant, commander of the Falcon, I am informed there's a great quantity of cattle upon the Elizabeth Islands near Falmouth in this province which is absolutely necessary to prevent being carried to the main. You are to proceed 
to Par Tarpaulin Cove in His Majesty's Sloop under your command, and there endeavor to hinder any cattle, livestock, or hay upon the island being taken off, but you are under no account to suffer any injury to be done to the property of the persons of the inhabitants. You are to acquaint me as to the terms upon which they are inclined to sell. June 17, 1775, Battle of Bunker Hill. September 11, 1775, the Falmouth Selectman wrote, There has been hitherto a company of men stationed on Narshan which has greatly molested the ministerial ships in harboring in said Tarpon Cove and hindered their landing on said Narshan Island. And we humbly conceive that if a company of men be continued at said cove with a number of cannon placed at said harbor, they would render it a very uncomfortable station for the ministerial ships and keep them at a proper distance and deter them from landing and taking off the stock. Likewise, that some suitable man in this town may be appointed to muster said company. And the Falmouth Selectum later wrote, Colonel Freeman of Sandwich was appointed to issue the documents necessary for the new defense establishment. The officers selected to command the forces at Martha's Vineyard and Elizabeth Islands were Bas uh, Bacariah Bassett, Major, Company 1, Nathaniel Smith, Captain, Jeremiah Manter, First Lieutenant, Fortunatus Bassett, Second, Benjamin Smith, Captain, Militia Davis, First Lieutenant, James Saw, Second Lieutenant, Company 3, John Granis, Captain, and John Blossom, First Lieutenant, Samuel Hallett, Second Lieutenant, and Company 4, Elisha Nye, Captain, Stephen Nye, Jr., First Lieutenant, and John Russell, Second Lieutenant. December 8, 1776, British occupied Newport, having evacuated Boston in March 17, 1776. In October 17, 1777, Burgoyne surrendered his entire army, numbering 5,800 after the Battle of Saratoga. On February 6, the King of France formally recognized the United States and entered the war. March 3, 1778, the Vineyard refuses pilots. By a gentleman just arrived from New Bedford, we learn that a sloop of 14 guns, the Harlem, had been sent from Newport to Martha's Vineyard to demand pilots for the fleet destined for Boston to take Burgoyne's troops back to England. They refused to comply with the demand, and the sloop sailed for Newport, it is said, to bring force sufficient to lay waste the island. March 8, 1778, Vice Admiral Lord Howe resigned his command, which said generally he was favorable to us and wanted to rapprochement, and Clinton was newly instructed by the king to destroy maritime activities in New England. It became a part of a world war. May 3rd, 1778, Joseph Nye writes from Nashon, one of the enemy's ships and two or three armed vessels arrived there, Nashon, and made demand of the stock on Nashon Island. Upon being refused, landed a party of men and were collecting the sheep on one of the outer islands in order to carry them off. This was the very day the service time expired of the five militiamen who were stationed there, and having sent in vain for assistance from the Falmouth militia, they were put to the disagreeable necessity of abandoning the fort after removing everything in it but the cannon, as there is now no force upon the island. In the fall, September 5, 1778, Major, Gray Charles, Major General Charles Gray raided New Bedford, Fairhaven, and Martha's Vineyard. This is a big deal. Gray's force of 4,000 men, our troops, was diverted for raiding by General Sir Henry Clinton. Gray raided New Bedford and Fairhaven, encountering significant resistance only in Fairhaven. His troops destroyed storehouses, shipping, and supplies in New Bedford, where they met with light resistance from the local militia. 
the damage fewer American holes at Fairhaven where the militia resistance had additional time to organize. He then sailed for Martha's Vineyard, which was undefended. Between September 10th and 15th, his residents surrendered 10,000 head of sheep, 300 oxen, as well as most of the island's weapons. Falmouth, Sandwich, and Barnstable militia defended Falmouth, but it was not attacked because of its strategic unimportance. Two large rope walks were destroyed in Falmouth, and two sloops and a schooner were cut out. Nantucket, its destruction was a major objective of the Great Raid, was spared only because of adverse tides and winds. Nantucket was the richest city in the, the world at that point in time. It had over 200 sail, and it was a very, very wealthy and important place. Later, in the spring, March 30th, 1779, another thing occurred. George Leonard, a wealthy Massachusetts loyalist and one of the refugees from Boston in 1776, these are, say, people who were displaced and move, had to move out of their property by force of uh, the, the uh, Patriots, devised a plan to raid the New England coast. The loyalists, or, or refugees, were instrumental in providing the British garrison with cattle, provision, and firewood, taking it from the rebels. Their boldest excursion was to negotiate a supply contract with Martha's Vineyard without any hostilities. One joint operation between the provincials and the refugees took place between 30 March and April 6, 1779, to Bedford, modern New Bedford, Massachusetts. The, ta the attachment was ordered to proceed to Bedford, where they were to occupy the town, destroy all public stores, barracks, storehouses, etc. The expedition failed due to wind not allowing the ships enter the harbor and the rebels gathering in numbers to oppose them. They sailed off to Falmouth. Privateers bombarded the town for two hours. The intent of the raids was to retaliate upon the inhabitants of the several provinces in America in actual rebellion against the sovereign and to wage war upon their inhuman persecutors and to use every means in their power to obtain redress and compensation for the indignities and losses they had suffered. That is to say, revenge. April 1st in Falmouth. In the afternoon, Major Dimmick, one of our local heroes, was informed that about 10 or 12 vessels were seen in the sound steering this way, intent upon destroying this town. He immediately sent expresses, that is to say messengers, to sandwich and barnstables for the militia to come to our assistance. Colonel Freeman with Captain Swift and Fish of Sandwich and their companies arrived here that night and Saturday morning. It is said in the evening of the second was spent by several of the British officers in a frolic at the house of one John Slocum on Pasque Island. Slocum was a well-known Tory. He of course was possessed of all their plans but as he reflected on their purpose, his story, his Tory sympathies gave way, and he secretly dispatched his son down the islands to cross over the hole that night and give warning to the Falmouth people. April 2nd, 1779, having a refugee for their conductor, a marauding party from the fleet now lying at Tarplon Cove, eluding the vigilance of our watch, Landed their boats, landed from their boats, and proceeded to Woods Hole to the farms of Messrs. Ephraim and Manasseh Swift. They drove off 12 head of cattle, knocked them on the head at the beach, and were in the act of taking their carcasses on board when surprised by Dimmick and the Falmouth militia. The refugees who acted as guides, that's to say Perry of Sandwich, I believe, knew that the Swifts kept fine dairies and the offers had determined on were had determined on their possession of a good supply of fresh butter and rich cheeses therefore whilst the main body were robbing stalls pigsties and hen roosts a party entered one of the houses april 3rd 1779 soon after the fog cleared off and several of the vessels appeared against the town near a low level piece of ground that extends from the shore quite to the houses. 
There had been a small entrenchments made some years ago upon the edge of the beach, which yet remained. Colonel Freeman marched the remainder of his men down to the shore, posting about 50 in said entrenchment and about 30 at about 130 yards dis rods distance, being the most convenient place for the enemy to land. At about half past 11, they formed their fleet consisting of two schooners in eight sloops into a line against the two posts and commenced a very warm fire on our people with cannonballs, double-headed shot, bars of iron, grape shot and small arms, and manned their boats, about 10 in number, with about 220 men, and made various attempts to land at several places, keeping up a constant fire upon our people from about half past 11 until half past 5 in the evening. Colonel Freeman and Major Dimmick, with about 50 men, defended the entrenchments and repeatedly challenged them, being within call, to land, which they durst not attempt. Our people till now had generally reserved their fire, but being ordered to fire, they soon moved off into the sound, where they remained quiet until the next morning. A party of them in their boats attempted to land at Woods Hole, uh, but about 30 of our men posted there gave them a warm fire, which soon drove them into the sound, where they remained quiet until the next morning. April 4th, 1779. A party of them in their boats went to Nonamesset, an island in Woods Hole, where they landed and killed the few sheep, cows, and hogs the enemy had before left, and threatened to kill the family that lived there, because, they said, the damn rebels had been killing them. They had two wounded men with them. Our people being about to go on the island, they retreated precipitately to their boats, carrying off only one hog and half a cow that calved that day before. They inquired of the island's people of our numbers and said, the rebels fought like devils. April 5th, 1779. They then landed at Nantucket, nearly 200 strong, entered the town with drawn swords and fixed bayonets and styled themselves loyal refugees. They owned that they had been to Falmouth and intended to have landed, but the rebels, who lay in ambush, fired upon them, killing 15 and wounding 20. Edward Winslow, formerly of Plymouth, was commanding officer when at Falmouth, was wounded and gone to Newport with a ball in his chest. This was told by the sentries through John Leonard, formerly of Boston, who pretended that it was gout. This Leonard being next in command, and Pelham Windsor, formerly of Plymouth. One Murray of Rutland stood next. Two uh, were Brigner Ruggles' sons. Ruggles was a notable from Sandwich, Mass. In summary, they fired on Saturday about 500 cannon. Had the entrenchments been given up, the town could not have been saved, their numbers on Friday being much superior to ours, and no men came to enforce the Sandwich and Falmouth men until the firing was over on Sunday, Saturday. Colonel Freeman and Major Dimmick, with their officers and men, behaved with the greatest prudence, resolution, and bravery. And we hope the enemy of our country will be deterred from future attempts on this town the weather was favorable, for although many of the buildings were struck by the fire of the assailants, the thaw prevented the rebounding of their missiles and little damage was done. Alarms, however, continued to be frequent. My, in my notes, I close by speaking about uh, Major Dimmick, who was a hero in Falmouth, and I, I commend you to read that. He was quite a remarkable person and my personal hero of the Revolutionary War times. That concludes my remarks and I thank you very much for your attention. The young dead soldiers do not speak. Nevertheless, they are heard in the still houses. Who has not heard them? They have a silence that speaks for them at night and when the clock counts. They say, we were young we have died. Remember us. They say they have done what we could, but until it's finished, it is not done. They say we have given our, our lives, but until it is finished, no one can know what our lives gave. They say our deaths are not ours. They are yours. They will mean what you make them. 
They say whether our lives and our deaths were for peace and new hope or for nothing we cannot say. It is you who must say this. We leave you our details. Give them their meaning. We were young, they say. We have died. Remember us. Amen. <laughs>